we're kicking off today's episode all about sex. Now, if you listened to our episode back all the way last year in December with Dr. Larissa, we started to explore the importance of self-love making. But I thought, what better way to enter the new year than with a podcast all about sex? Because sex really is an important pillar of our overall health. And I'm not quite sure why it's taken me this long to record an episode on it. Let go of an idea that orgasm has to happen and that orgasm is the only end goal of having sex. My gosh, did today's episode really open my eyes and conversation around this subject? Because it's one that we shouldn't shy away from. It's one that we shouldn't feel stigma or embarrassment when it comes to it. And by the end of this episode, I definitely didn't. Because today's episode, we have Phoebe. She is a love, sex, and relationship coach, and she really helps us explore what is energetic lovemaking, what's the difference between sex versus intimacy, the difference between same-sex couples and heterosexual couples, what's the importance of having a sexual relationship with ourselves. After this episode, you may have a prescription on energetic lovemaking, and it's one that I would actively invite you to explore. It is fascinating talking to BB. It made me realize there is so much on this subject that we really shy away from and we don't approach, even in our peer groups. So I hope you find this episode as fascinating and as explorative as I did. And then if you're already down this explorative route, I welcome you to share this with somebody who maybe isn't. I have to say, it's quite a personal one. It's definitely one of the most graphic podcasts we've recorded to date. So buckle up, sit down and get ready to learn all about orgasms, masturbation and energetic lovemaking. Vivi, welcome to Live Well, Be Well. How are you? First of all, I am very, very excited. I love having conversations with powerful women on a mission uh, in just co-creating and making an impact in the world. So I am very, very excited for this conversation. I'm beyond excited. I'm beyond excited. I have to say, and I'm going to be honest, a bit nervous because I've never spoke about this publicly or openly, but I'm excited at the same time. And I feel like I want to feel, and I know I will, and I know our listeners will feel really empowered. And I think our listeners, be male or female, will both feel empowered, hopefully after this conversation, because your story is absolutely fascinating. And you have dedicated so much of your life recently to really empowering the conversation and opening up and reducing the stigma around sex. So today we're really going to focus on sex. We're going to explore orgasms. We're going to look at relationships, sex versus intimacy, the positive psychology of sex. Is sex good for us? So I cannot wait to divulge into this conversation with you. But before I do, BB, I'd love to start the podcast by asking you a question that I ask all of my guests. And that is, what's the one thing that you've changed your mind about in the last 10 years? What I changed my mind about is that it is too late in life to do certain things at some point. That, for example, at an age of 30 something, it's too late to reinvent your career. Or at an age of 40, it's too late to find your purpose. Or let's say at an age of 65, it is too late to really start exploring your sexuality. I realized that there is really nothing like too late. And I, you know, reinvented myself in an age of 35. And I have seen my client having huge breakthroughs and at age of 65 or 70, women reclaiming their sexuality while you know, like the common opinion would be that it's already too, do, too late to do all these things. It's never too late. So listen to your intuition, follow your instinct, trust your gut and go for it regardless of what age you're at. And it's important because I definitely did change my mind around this. I was in a corporate world for 15 years, super scared. And every year I was thinking it's too late. It's too late to leave that uh, security. It's too late to go after my dreams. It's too late to start from zero. And it's not, it's never too late. 
I love that. That gives so much hope, doesn't it, that it's too late? Because I think the biggest thing that so many of us struggle with is the fear of failure. And I think that really kind of digresses with that it's too late to do that because we're going to fail. We've missed the boat. And I can really resonate with you saying that, actually. And I would love to know, you didn't think it was too late because at the age of 35, you transitioned from the corporate world into a sex and relationship coach. And I would just love to know, how did you transition to that journey? How did you feel to jump the boat and empower women and men around the topic of sex? Because there's a lot of shame attached to that, even in an intimate relationship, talking openly. But you're now channeling this publicly, which is just amazing. But the confidence behind that, I'd just love to know what your transition was and your mindset was at that time. Yeah. And, you know, I just want to clarify that and put it into context. Today, I think, is so much more common to be an online coach and to be a coach around sexuality. But when I have decided to do that, it wasn't as common yet. So definitely it wasn't because it was trendy or because I wanted to jump on a train of online coaching. I really left my corporate world. It was about 10 years ago. In 2012, I grew up in communism. And growing up, seeing my parents being so limited in many different areas of their life, they had no freedom, they had no financial means uh, to do things they wanted to do, I decided that I'm going to change that. So at that time, for me, it was really brave to join the best university, then work for some of the biggest companies around the world and earn my own money and be successful and become a manager and live in New York, Sydney, Mexico City, Sao Paulo, being moved with a company. So I kind of on the paper had all those successful experiences <laughs> on my resume, but on the inside, I was not feeling fulfilled. I was not happy. Uh, my heart was not singing. So for many years, I distracted myself from that void, from that lack of fulfillment. There's so many uh, distractions that our society offers in abundance from traveling, shopping, casual sex, partying, you name it. But after a while, it stopped working and then I had nowhere to hide. And I really sat down and I asked myself, it was kind of a mini midlife crisis because I really asked myself, okay, I know what I don't want. I know what I don't like, but what is it that I am passionate about? What's my mission? What's my purpose in this lifetime? What am I doing here on this planet, right? It was such an overwhelming question that got me into my midlife crisis. But that was, again, the most powerful portal of growth for me. And finally led me to quitting the corporate life and the golden cage and the security of a monthly salary. And I embarked on a journey and I had absolutely no idea where it's going to take me. And I've done all kinds of things from medicinal plants, Vipassana, Landmark, etc., etc. And I came across a course where I have awakened my sexual energy. And the teacher told me that I had a full body orgasm. I didn't know exactly what happened on a mind level, but I could feel it and something clicked and something changed. And basically life was never the same after that. And I started to explore. I wanted to know what it is. How can I come back to the state? How can I make it more sustainable? How can I call it in the time I want? So I started exploring and then the more I was discovering, the more excited I got. And I basically, could not stop talking about it, Sarah. I would go on dinners, lunches, breakfasts, gym. I would talk about this full body orgasm phenomenon everywhere. <laughs> what is a full body orgasm? I think everyone's we're gonna, listening to this going, Yeah, what we're gonna is answer that? that. Yeah, we're gonna answer that. We're gonna answer that. But so to finish this story, actually the, the reaction is not what you think. You would think that people will be criticizing you, will people will be judging. Actually, my experience is the opposite. People are so curious. People have so many questions around it. People are challenged and struggling in this area of their life. And when they hear someone speak about it, more than anything, there is curiosity and there is questions. So that was my experience. And basically what started to happen is that after those casual conversations, people would come back, friends would come back saying, hey, after that conversation, I think I had a full body orgasm. I felt energy, something switched, something changed. And I realized that just from having those conversations, there was a seed planted. They were given permission and their experiences around sexuality started to change. 
And basically, I never planned on becoming sexuality coach. I call it more conscious sexuality coach. I'm a generator in my human design, so I usually wait for an invitation. So there was that invitation, and I was just there ready to see it, ready to accept it. And I saw that I was making impact on people. I saw that something beautiful was being spread and born and I followed that intuition and I followed this calling and then people came and asked for more. So that is how it kind of organically continued and evolved into that. So very different from our previous corporate life when I would always have five year goal and a plan and I would just, you know, first have the goal and a plan and then go get it. This was the other way around. I just find it fascinating because I one have so much admiration for anyone who kind of leaves that security because it can be really terrifying to know you're not going to be getting that paycheck every month. But I think the thing that fascinates me the most is that you just had this confidence to explode into this space of sex and sexuality. I really want to depict what a full body orgasm is because I, th I really want to know if how many of our listeners are relating to that right now. But before I do, do you think you're quite a sexual person? Because it is quite an interesting field that you leaned into because I think many people can even struggle to have this conversation with an intimate partner or even with themselves. So to actually kind of be able to freely talk about this with friends and people around you and then embark on a career, do you feel like you have quite a sexual energy in yourself? That's something you always had or do you think that's something you just grew into? You know what? I do. However, I don't think it's actually related to the ability of having those conversations. I think what most importantly shifted for me is a perception of what sexuality is, what it can be. Because let's be honest, when we hear the word sex, because pornography is so readily available and because it is a source of education for most of us, immediately that picture comes to mind. So then there is a certain discomfort. If you shift your perception of sexuality as a loving presence, divine union, a ritual, an act of love, an act of oneness, togetherness, then do you feel uncomfortable talking about that? Do you feel no. uncomfortable talking about feeling as one with your partner, about feeling love and about going into higher states of consciousness and losing yourself in each other and melting on a soul level? Does that make you uncomfortable? No, but do you know what I think society has elicited on us? Definitely, I really want to talk to you more about the pornography side of things, but I think there's so much around worrying that someone's going to judge you or the interaction you're having with someone, because I think having that intimacy is really important but I think you can feel very vulnerable in that moment and it's interesting just how when you grow up in sex education you're spoken about how to not get pregnant but you're not spoken around any other topics and I think then we grow up with pornography or we have this like lads locker room kind of jokey conversations and kind of women are quite submissive and I think it has skewed the conversations that we're all having. So when we might want to act on our desires, we might feel wrong or ashamed. I think there's such a bigger picture there. And I think that is then what creates this huge sense of shame and worry around exploring this. As you said it, putting it into something that's really loving yeah. is very different. Yeah, and as you mentioned, you know, there's when you look at the conditioning that we grew up with around sexuality, it creates, first of all, again, a lot of shame, a lot of misunderstanding. And is it the religious upbringing? Is it just having conservative parents? Is it slut shaming? And just let's be honest, 5,000 years of patriarchy, all this unrealistic body image that we are constantly exposed to, where women are, you know, insecure about their bodies. Like in every angle you look, there is so, so, so many reasons that we don't feel comfortable, right? And it really is not a topic that is taught. It's similar as spirituality, emotional intelligence, right? All that is not really a part of basic education. So it, on top of that, that becomes this taboo topic that we feel uncomfortable that we're speaking about. But I think... Even looking at it from a different perspective of, again, being a law, divine act of love and connection, what I have observed helps people to open up that conversation. 
before we get into that, I still need to know what a full body orgasm yes. is. I feel like I'm directing myself off this topic, but I, mm-hmm. I'm dying to hear, to know if we've all had a full body orgasm or not. And then I want to talk to you about how do we know if we've had an orgasm? Because I think some people might really feel lost in that conversation, especially women. So let's start off with what is a full body orgasm? So how I like to describe it is... First, let's see what full body orgasm is not, and then it will be easier to do a comparison. So because we have sex mainly a certain way in our society, and it's mainly based on a lot of friction, a lot of fast friction, and a lot of stimulation that really builds up the arousal, builds up the excitement, and brings us to this overwhelming lust, a lot of fire, and that result, and later on we actually contract we actually hold our breath in order to experience that explosion that climax as we know it right and so it's mainly experienced in the genitals there is a clear climax usually it would last let's say five to ten seconds and after that there is a period of contraction so this is how we most commonly understand orgasm in our society and that is what you will see when you go to wikipedia now, in my field, and let's say Neo Tantra uh, field, how we can talk about the orgasm is that when we actually focus less on the friction, but we're going to slow down and we're going to start being fully present with these different levels of arousal, with that pleasure, without taking it so high, without it being so fiery, So we can actually, again, be present with it. And then using the tools that allow us to move that sexual energy beyond the area area of the genitals, right? So we can use breath, we can use sound, we can use relaxation, visualization, so that energy can actually start moving. And it can move away from the genitals all the way up to your crown chakra. And what happens when we move the energy from lower areas where it's dense, where it's matter, and we're going to start lifting it, it becomes more subtle. It becomes higher frequency. And also when we're going to start moving this energy to our belly, then to our heart, then to our chest, then to our third eye, the quality of that sexual energy will change and it will be experienced different. So what I like to say, it's really not at a genital focused and peak climatic experience it's actually the opposite it's the full body it's more blissful uh, it's more relaxed i actually like to say sarah that instead of having an orgasm you become orgasmic it's a prolonged state of being and also a higher state of consciousness that you can be in for 20 minutes half an hour and you start to ride those waves and you're doing much less, but you being present much more. And you are allowing instead of chasing and forcing. And it's expansive rather than based on tension and explosion. And last thing I'm going to add here uh, is that instead of directing the sexual energy downwards and outwards, we direct it inwards and upwards. And we retain it and we circulate it. And that's also where a lot of magic happens. I am absolutely thrilled that this week's sponsor is an app that I have been using on a regular basis since I came off my contraceptive pill. Natural Cycles is the only CE certified contraceptive app in Europe. Now, I personally love it because my decision to come off the pill is that I didn't want to keep taking hormones. And since it's an app, Natural Cycles is 100% natural, which means it's non-hormonal and has no side effects. It also helps teach you about your own body and unique cycles, which has been really helpful for me to track my periods and my mood. Now, Natural Cycles is for 18 plus and it does not protect against STIs. But if you would love to give it a go, Natural Cycles has given my listeners 20% off your first annual subscription and a free thermometer. All you have to do is use the code livewell at www.naturalcycles.com forward slash livewell. I think it's amazing. I think so many times we are focus on instant gratification that's how I feel like sex is portrayed to so many people is like just reach that orgasmic state how quickly can you do it I think it happens much quicker for men than it does for women I think there's a lot of fog around how you reach that orgasm what an orgasm feels like so 
I know that 15% of women have never had an orgasm. And I think there's a lot of shame and stigma, especially for women that can come around that. And they maybe feel afraid to open up about that. They maybe feel afraid that they there's something wrong with them. Maybe they're broken. So could we maybe just talk a bit about what does an orgasm feel like? And if people are struggling to orgasm, how can they lean more into understanding what would work for them? Because it's not always a one solution fits all, is it? Absolutely. So I'm just, again, going to actually invite you, especially for us women, this, the, the orgasm can feel so differently. So I would like to say, first of all, if one of the listeners, if it is you, if you feel like you never experienced an orgasm, I actually invite you. There's a phenomenal book by Emily Nagoski called Come As You Are, which actually explains that you are absolutely normal. And I think it will be very informative and assuring. So that's one. Number two, I would actually love to expand the idea of an orgasm. So what we talked about is the climax, right? Which is in genitals, it's followed by that explosion, then a contraction. But for us women, we can really experience orgasms in so many ways. First of all, uh, we can have crygasms. We can have laughgasms. We can have angergasms. Women in my courses experience all of those. Then we can have a full body orgasm. Then we have, can have an energy orgasm. Then we can have a breastgasm. We can have a clitoral orgasm, G-spot orgasm, cervical orgasm, anal orgasm. Then we can have, you know, really I experienced a neckgasm. Experiencing that intense pleasure where you bring all your energy, when you bring all your focus and all your presence, it can absolutely feel orgasmic. So I want to really expand this crygasm. I want to expand the idea of what an orgasm can be. Okay, so this will actually help uh, when women who think that they're not orgasmic, something is wrong with them. It's like, yeah, well, actually, wait, when I was in this sad state and I was crying and I finally let go and I released, I felt that there was some kind of a shift and that something clicked and then I went into a full state of surrendered and we can call that an orgasmic state. Okay, so I am inviting everyone to expand their idea of orgasm uh, and not just stick to the one that is officially presented to us. And I would like to invite people, instead of focusing again on having an orgasm, focusing on becoming orgasmic, okay? And focusing on being fully present with moment to moment sensation, with moment to moment pleasure. Because Sarah, the challenge is that when we start focus, that's the challenge itself, that we are so focused on the orgasm in our sexuality. And again, part of it's pornography, Again, it's, it's, you know, done by men, mainly by men for men. And it has a lot of male qualities, not necessarily so healthy, not necessarily so educational. And there is a lot of focus on the action and there is a lot of importance in the end goal. Now, the tricky part of this, if we're just going to start focusing on an orgasm, Sarah, the orgasm is not happening in the present moment. It's happening ahead of us, ahead of time, in the future. So you are not fully present with your pleasure in the moment. You're focusing on that thing ahead of you, taking you out of the present. And then again, what I am more interested in is in you relaxing into the pleasure from moment to moment, surrendering to it, and those orgasmic states will come. It's such a big thing, isn't it? Because I think that is just literally the philosophy of life. It's just enjoy the moment and be present. And it can feel like a pressure, I think, for two people when they're in a bedroom to make sure that they're performing correctly or, you know, that they're showing that they're being pleasured. All of those things, I think, puts a lot of pressure on the situation. And something that I'm also really interested in, and I think a lot of our listeners are because they wrote this to me on Instagram as a message, when I said I was going to do a um, podcast on this topic, was what's the difference between a men's orgasm and a woman's orgasm? Because I do think they are quite different. Women can have multiple orgasms, it seems, but men can't. So what's the difference between a men's orgasm and a woman's orgasm? Or have I also just got that wrong? Yeah, no, that's not wrong, I would say. (laughs) There's nothing right or wrong. They're just different perspectives and points of view. So I would say... 
it depends which lens you're gonna look through if you look through the body geography right male orgasm will be mainly from the penis and anal orgasm right like if you look at our geography actually there is a breast gasm nipple gasm there is a clitoral orgasm there is a g-spot orgasm there is a cervical orgasm right so there is a little bit more of a variety but what i would like to focus on here is actually the fact that those energy orgasms those full body orgasms those valley orgasms those orgasmic states are possible regardless the gender regardless how you identify yourself we all have sexual energy and we can all tap into it and we can all use tools like breath sound awareness intention do you see that? So depending on which lens you're going to look through, then there will be different possibilities. So how could somebody reach multiple orgasms? So say there's a listener listening to this now and they're really inspired, but they're, they've never reached a multi-orgasmic state and they've never maybe even heard of half of the orgasms that you've just listed. I think when we first spoke, actually, you said there's 150 different types of orgasms. So they're like vast. Hmm. That, I, think <laughs> I don't know if I said that, but I think it was written somewhere. There will be, again, depending who you talk to, there will be different number of orgasms. Uh, I want to say, let's say there's infinite number of possibilities because if you really allow and surrender and allow this energy to do its work, it might be a different experience every time. So again, I think, you know, why do we want to become multi-orgasmic? <laughs> so, right? So we get, because look what we're going. We are again going after the orgasm in this conversation. You see that? Yeah, I do. But I think so many people have never heard of maybe these terms. And I think it's also depicting that it's not just through one type of sex. There's yeah. so many different layers that you can reach these states, which Absolutely. I think we're very fixed on, no, maybe it's part of foreplay, penetration, and then that's sex. Um, and I think what I'm hearing from you and what sounds quite obvious from how you're explaining it is that there's so many other layers to having mm -hmm. orgasms. But how do we feel confident enough to tap into that? What's the kind of the routes yeah. to access yeah. these? I want to revert the answer a little bit, and I would say the following. So if you ask someone who asks a question, okay, I want to reach this type of an orgasm, I would say, okay, what will that bring you? What will achieving this type of orgasm or experiencing this type of orgasm bring you that you're looking for? And it might be, the answers might be maybe a release, a sense of relaxation, a sense of closeness and intimacy with my partner, pleasure. So what I am really interested in is all these things, not just this one point. So what I observe is that we actually often in our society, people have sex, but they are not intimate. They are not feeling connected. They are not feeling nourished. They're not feeling fulfilled. They're not feeling energized after the act of sex. And maybe they even had an orgasm. But again, it was just that short friction kind of uh, action-oriented sex with a short peak orgasm, okay? To me, the interesting question is how to shift our experience of sexuality so we can bring all these things that we're looking for in the orgasm itself. And sometimes they don't necessarily mean you have to have an orgasm. Do you see that? Yeah. <laughs> so, for example, what I, how can people start exploring this? I actually would love everyone to start exploring it with an idea that you don't have to have an orgasm, neither when you self-pleasure nor when you are having sex with a partner. I want you to shift your awareness, shift your focus on being fully present in the moment. That's what I'm going to invite everyone. And then watch what happens. When you start applying all these tools, the orgasm will happen as a byproduct. The orgasm will happen as a byproduct of you being relaxed, of you being present, or you feel safe, or you feel connected, or you really being in tune with your body. But we don't have to be so obsessively focused on that. So again, I would say taking away the goal-oriented approach, because this actually 
will allow us to relax, to drop in, to stop the performative pleasure that we are so used to. Stop thinking, oh, what am I going to do next to get there? What am I going to do next to impress my partner? And just letting go of all that pressure will change the dynamic. I would love everyone to slow down. I would like to slow down, not just for a minute, but for the entire time. Because it is in the slowness that we can tap into more subtle sensations, that we can actually start feeling energy, that we can practice meditation, that we can be enjoying a very soft, gentle touch. So slowing down and actually I would say the number one tool, if someone just walks away one tool from this podcast, which is I would invite you to bring conscious breath to your practice. So normally we are fast, shallow chest breathers and that it's perfectly fine because it activates our fight or flight nervous system, the analytical mind. But if you really want to drop and if you really want to relax and you want to move away from the mind and into your body and one of the questions that I get the most or one of the challenges that I get the most is people telling me it's just I'm so in my head I am so in my mind it's so difficult to relax and be fully present and let go so breath is really one of the number one tools for that for a reason it became so trendy now Okay, so I just want you to bring awareness to your breath and I would love you to start applying deep belly breathing. If you have no experience with breath, breathe in through the nose. If you already experienced different types of breath works, you feel more confident, you can breathe in lightly but deeply in through your mouth. And in either case, you're going to be exhaling with your jaw relaxed, exhaling through your open mouth making a sound, <sighs> those vocal cords will tune in your vagus nerve. It will actually help you to relax even more. So just with that, your experiences will start to shift. Okay. And now there is one more trick to this, to this homework. And I'm a big proponent from the, of that. And if, if anyone follows me, uh, you know that that I am a big fan of self-love practice. I on purpose don't use the word masturbation because I feel there is such a negative charge when it comes to that. What I am talking about, if anything, could be high vibration masturbation or intentional self-pleasure, self-love ritual or practice. So you can actually start exploring your own body. You can start exploring what types of touch do you like what kind of sensations do you have what brings you pleasure how does this type of breath that i invited you to do changes your own experience and being in this comfort of being with yourself and in your own body and again not chasing an orgasm but being present with pleasure from moment to moment and allowing yourself to be taken on this journey i would say one hour journey a week I invite everyone to schedule one hour self-pleasure practice into your calendar a week and think of it as combining spirituality and sexuality, combining your meditation, combining potentially even your yoga practice with pleasure, which pleasure which is healing, which pleasure that is your birthright, which pleasure that is such a beautiful way to honor our body and actually also experience self-love. So we can kind of bring all these elements together in that one hour. This takes me so nicely on to the question that I was wanting to lead on to, which I think a lot of people really struggle with. And we, we did touch upon it in the beginning before we, we delve straight into the orgasms. But it's shame because a lot of people, and I think a, a barrier for many, and I touched upon this continuously through the podcast of social narratives, but can find it quite shameful to tap into this side of themselves just from I guess the outward messaging that we've maybe grown up with or become aware of or maybe been told that it's wrong when we're younger so getting out of your head can feel quite hard for many people from looking at your page you talk about this a lot kind of getting out of your head and reconnecting with yourself and self-exploration sounds like one of them but how can we really help shift our mindset away from shame how can we kind of really try to empower that side more? Yeah. And you know, this is really, really a deep work. 
And for example, in my courses, which for a reason on my online courses, for example, are 12 weeks long because it takes time. So first of all, realizing what are our beliefs around sexuality? Okay. And they will be coming from our upbringing, from our school, from our parents, caretaker, from our environment. So just even journaling. What messages around sexuality did I receive from my school? What messages around sexuality are received from my parents? Or maybe what kind of experiences or events in my life, especially in my childhood, shaped my view on sexuality? Okay, and again, this is a very deep work because if you even look at the research, it shows that, for example, in the Americas, there is one in four or five women that have experienced a history of sexual abuse, right? And this will leave a mark on your entire life. Now, it's not as easy as just telling yourself, hey, from today on, I'm not going to feel shame for around that, okay? Because these are deep defense mechanisms and neuropaths that sit in our subconscious mind, right? So the first quality that I'm going to invite is awareness and then compassion. And this is really, really important. Instead of judging yourself or beating yourself up or criticizing yourself around, oh, I, I feel shameful. I am not experienced. I cannot liberate myself in bed. Hold yourself with love and compassion because that defense mechanism is there for a reason. Okay. And it's been working very, very hard to protect you for so many years. Now, secondly, I would recommend, especially, and let's be honest, Sarah, again, between the history of sexual abuse, slut shaming, insecurities around our bodies, there are a lot of deep limiting beliefs that we have. So I would do a work around it. And is it a course or is it, you know, is it a a coach or a therapist or is it a retreat maybe? So finding a way that resonates with you, but being held through this journey. We don't have to do it all alone and we don't have to do it all ourselves. And I think, you know, what is so powerful is that it's the first time in the history that we are openly having these conversations. It's only last few years that there are podcasts, books, courses, people are invited to be on stage, on Goop, on Netflix, around the topic of sexuality. So for the first time in the history, we have access to so much information, to so many teachings, to so much education around it. So let's take advantage of that. Yeah, I think honestly, it's the same with any topic, isn't it? The more that you talk about it and the more that you normalize it, I think it's really important because, I mean, I'm just talking about myself here, but I just grew up, you know, with looking at magazines, reading things. And there's quite a big British magazine here called Cosmopolitan, which is you know, how many times a week should you be having sex, healthy relationships last if you have sex every day. And you hear all of these kind of messages and then you kind of skew your own opinion and your own thoughts and feelings to kind of fit into these narratives because you think, well, I've got to have sex every day for this relationship to be healthy or if I get married, that's apparently what a healthy marriage is. And so you you become quite skewed and quite sponge-like into these mixed messages as opposed to what you're talking about which really exploring more about yourself and that can feel quite frightening and it can also feel quite frightening I think to do it with a partner and that's something I'd love to talk about a bit now is is relationships because once we become comfortable with ourselves and, and if we can get to that state how can we then communicate that openly to a partner because I think communication is such a core part of connection but also intimacy that you were talking around sex how can we create the best scenarios for us to both understand one another in in partnerships yeah so i would start with the following that actually fully the work on yourself even in partnership is equally important and i love to give this example i've given it a couple of times but it really really resonates with me and i would like you to imagine a, a duo concert of two guitar players who come together and play a concert, right? And imagine that those two guitar players come together and none of them knows exactly how to play their own guitar. What kinds of concert is that going to be? How in sync are they going to be? Not so much, right? So to me, it really starts with learning how to play your own instrument, understanding your own challenges, your own limiting beliefs, your own uh, defense mechanisms, 
why is that step important? Because this allows you to actually understand what is your contribution to the relationship. And I'm going to give an example. As a matter of fact, yesterday I had an interview with the couple who came to me a few months ago. And she first decided she's going to do a course women only first, and then they're going to work as a couple. This conversation yesterday that we had, she finished my course for women, they're going to start a couple work, was a completely different conversation that we had a few months ago. Because they are challenged and they're struggling in their sex life, but before they were both pointing fingers at the partner. Now, after diving so deep inside of herself, she realized she was actually feeling so much shame. She wasn't relaxing. She wasn't really feeling sensations in her body. She wasn't feeling safe, so on and so on and so on. So now, when they started to do the work together, they both took responsibility for their part. It's not blaming the partner anymore. It's like, okay, I have my own things to work on, but now we also want to work together. So that is the first step. Second step that I would have is approach it from a place of exploration rather than mastery. That's a really important for me. Exploration versus mastery. So let's explore. Let's learn something new. It's not about us being perfect in sex. It's not about us being a porn star. It's not about us being the best in bed among our friends. It's something we want to explore together. So we both don't know. We are both students. Let's explore. Let's ask questions. Let's, let's see what's out there. But from the place of curiosity. What questions do you think we should be asking one another? Because I think people could be quite afraid to even think about what those questions could be. I think it's that block, right? It's the block of, yeah. okay, well, I feel I can speak to this person, but what are the questions that I can ask? And it's, yeah. can we kind of direct our audience into what yeah. they can ask each other? Yeah, so I would prepare set and setting first. So I wouldn't do it, you know, on the way to the airport or I wouldn't do it after you had a big fight. Set and setting actually for me are really important. So uh, suggest um, an intimate uh, date, a dive deeper date to your partner, set up the mood. Uh, have beautiful music, the lighting, maybe, I don't know, I don't drink alcohol, but maybe you feel like you want to open a bowl of wine. So create a setting that will invite closeness, coziness, safety, openness, that will help. Now, I would start with a question to just open it up. I would actually, uh, I love to ask this question, and I would put a timer for five minutes and I would ask each partner to say the following. What do you love about me? And then the other partner has five minutes to talk nonstop about everything they love in their partner. The receiver is there to listen like a hollow bamboo, <laughs> just receiving and taking it in. When the alarm rings, we're going to switch partners. So this is how I would open the conversation, okay? With this will really feel heart opening. This will really feel like a beautiful, soulful, intimate connection. And from that place, it will be so much easier to explore uh, uncomfortable topics. Then I would, for example, start with a question. What is your favorite memory of us having sex? Or what is your favorite memory of us being intimate? Let's describe. Each partner describes that. And then from there, there can be a question, what would you like more of to explore in our sex life or in the bedroom? Is there something that you have fantasies about, but we never really went there? Is there something new you want to learn? And really asking an inquiry question. And from there, do you see the difference? It's not about you suck in bed, you're doing all wrong, yeah, it's positive it's, psychology, isn't it? It's exactly. about leaning in to actually the positives and the things that you can grow into. There's a, I think there's a lot of worry that a fear of doing things wrong, but actually you can do a lot more right if you communicate. Yeah. I think that's kind of the, yeah. the key part that I'm hearing here. And Exactly. So from this conversation, we can go further and 
Uh, what's your favorite position or what would you like to explore more of? What is something we have never done before and you would like to explore? So this is one route how I would go. Another route that I also um, invite people to take is, for example, whoever is listening to this podcast and wants to bring it to their partner, do exactly the same. Open uh, a bottle of wine, have maybe a cheese, I don't know, or something else if you're a vegan. <laughs> But prepare a nice, sexy date and suggest to your partner, hey, I have listened to this podcast or I've read this book or I, you know, saw this series on Netflix and it sparked my interest. I think it's really important for our relationship. I would love to explore that more with you. I would love to have a conversation and see what you think. I would love to bring more openness in that topic. I would love to, for us to listen to this podcast together or to read this book together or whatever it is. Would you be open for that? It would mean a lot to me. You would make me really, really happy. You see that? So this is how I would invite because what it does It's that you're not coming to your partner, hey, I listened to this podcast, it seems like we're doing everything wrong and you suck in bed, right? It's, you're only going to slam his ego. Instead, you are both in a position of students. So it's like, hey, I am also new to this. I also just heard it, but it's resonating with me and you are important for me. This relationship is important for me. So I think it will be really beneficial for us to listen. And this is another one that I really want to ask you, which will lead into this question, is how many times a week should we be having sex? I don't have an answer for this question because in, I think the question itself doesn't make sense for me. Because first of all, there is a word should. <laughs> we, we should not should. <laughs> okay. This is true. This is, but I, I say this only because exploring this podcast, the amount of times I've read questions of this is how many times you should be having sex to fulfill a happy marriage or this is why sex is so good for you for your immune system for your sleep for all of these things and funny enough I mean this is a, this is a personal side but I have always suffered with night terrors since I was a kid and I actually got taken to um, a sleep clinic where they basically put I don't even know what you call them but things all over my head and ECGs and, and tests all over my body and basically I couldn't sleep in the sleep clinic because I was wired up to the max. But the next day they told me that absolutely nothing was wrong with me, my brain was working fine, but I was just highly stressed and that's why I was having night terrors, which was interesting because I've been having them since I was a baby. So there wasn't anything kind of profound or anything had changed in my life. I didn't have a stressful childhood. So I think, you know, for me, I was like, okay, well, obviously this is still affecting me. I need to take action. And It was the weirdest conversation I've ever had because the consultant actually just sat there and said, what we say to people that are really stressed in the sleep clinic is just have lots of sex. Yeah. And so it was this interpretation of, okay, well, I know that there's lots of elements that sex is good for, but we are bombarded a lot of the time with sex is going to solve all of these problems, which can be really misconstrued. So I think especially if you're in a relationship and maybe one person is wanting more sex in the relationship and the other is less sexual or needing it less or maybe enjoying it less maybe that's the issue there it's very complex but there is this kind of like overwhelming question that I always yeah. hear is how many times a week should we be having sex yeah, yeah. and I just want it to be resolved <laughs> yeah 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 so you know so I tell you why this question again for me doesn't make sense because We go through seasons in life, for example, right? And we go through seasons in our relationship and there will be spring and summer that we are more active and then there will be moments of fall and winter when each partner goes more inwards. And, you know, I would love everyone to honor those seasons, both within ourselves and within our relationship. Also, it is different when you just had a baby. It is different when you're going through health issues. It's different if you're just happily newly married and you're in age of 30 or you are, you know, in the age of 60. But so for me, imposing a number doesn't really make sense. And I don't think there is one answer for this. Now, what I, I'm going to, again, shift the answer a little bit. So what I would invite couples to do and what I do as a part of my course or what I do with my clients is scheduling an intimacy time once a week, ideally two or three hours, okay? 
And so there is something in the calendar, and I love, you know, Tantra Tuesday, Sensual Sunday, do what works for you. Uh, maybe for some couples it's once a week. Maybe, you know, it depends. Make it work for you. Don't put something that is completely unachievable because you're going to get frustrated and you're going to abandon this really fast. So adjust it to what really can honestly work for you and have this space. Now, in this space, it doesn't have to be sex. I want you to drop in. I want you to relax. I want you to share practice. Actually, on my website, there is a free one-hour practice for partners called Soul Connector. Follow that audio, get intimate, become vulnerable, connect on a soul level. Then you might move towards sensuality. Then connect, definitely connection with the body. And what I mean by that intimate date is not just going to a restaurant and drinking wine or going to a cinema. I really mean quality time with each other and involving our body. But again, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have sex. But I want you to be relaxed and present enough to see and to allow yourself to your bodies to speak of what they need. Again, if you're relaxed enough, if you feel safe, if the pleasure is there, if the light, if, if the if this fire is being ignited, it will naturally transition to to um, to maybe intercourse. But it doesn't. Again, sex doesn't always have to be intercourse. Okay. In my courses, for example, I teach beautiful breast massage. And for so many women share, it's been so beautiful because when they, the week of doing that, they know they don't have to have an intercourse afterwards. Nothing has to happen. No one is pressured. They just can relax and then decide if they want to continue or not. But they can fully receive this breast massage. And for sometimes this will be the intimacy we are craving or a penis massage or hugging and just exchanging energy because we can exchange this energy even being fully in our clothes. So having this one hour intimacy time, which, you know, can take different forms. This is what I would recommend. It's completely transforming that perspective, isn't it? And it's around the intimacy side. But what would you say to people who aren't in a relationship then? How can they kind of create that space for themselves? To be honest with you, I am not in a relationship. And how do I create this for myself? So I bring the topic of conscious sexuality very early on, especially when I see that we are vibing, right? There's like a second date and I see that there is a potential for deeper connection and I am interested. I will bring the fact that I am interested in exploring conscious sexuality, that I like to talk about what each of us enjoys, what are our boundaries, what are our desires before we actually proceed any further. And I actually, again, use my own practices. This is why I have done this free practice called Soul Connector, where I go for a set of beautiful intimate questions. So we kind of really become intimate before we even touch each other. Then I really like to slowly move into the realms of sensuality. So it's not just straight into the panties. I actually guide my partners around my erogenous zones and it is especially my ears and my neck. I actually love to invite new partners on a breast massage and I clearly communicate that, setting up a clear container saying, hey, I feel an attraction. I'm not yet ready for penetration. But I would love to invite you on a breastgasmic, breast massage date. Would you be open for that? I posted on my Instagram actually saying I had 100% success rate with that. Men are so curious and uh, they want to learn. They love the fact that I'm taking initiative. And there's a beautiful connection, sensuality. And for me already, orgasmic states, the, the new partners are actually excited to see me experience so much pleasure. And that would be this. That would be it for that. So I also like a build-up. I like anticipation. I like the, you know, kind of growing into it. So there is more and more connection. There is more and more safety. And then gradually progressing and having time to have those conversations and getting to know each other and what we all like. And did I have, what about one night stands? Did I have those? Yes, of course, I did have those, but I must say that I have those only when I actually felt that we were really speaking the same language and 
I would still do these openings. I would still talk about desires, boundaries. I would still communicate what I like. And so even those one night stands, we're still conscious one night stands. I think it's so important, isn't it? Because I just keep hearing this instant gratification, just messaging all the time as you're talking because it's the opposite of what you're saying. And I think so much of our sex-driven culture is that instant gratification. And it's less about actually taking that time beforehand. And I think, especially for women, I think women really need that time and that safety and that space to feel seen and heard to actually reach those that you know those later states that, that we yeah. all desire. But it's actually about a lot about enjoying that process and less about just actually having the sex. It's about the whole thing together, isn't it? And and you know what, Sarah, I'm pressure. just gonna yeah, I'm gonna add just to do because it fits so well in what you just said. There is this, you know, um, it became more and more popular now. There is this description of junk food sex versus gourmet or organic, you know, gourmet sex, right? So it's again like you said exactly the same thing that has happened as in every area of your li- our lives, right? The, the, the junk food that you eat for that, you know, sugar rush in the moment or something healthy that takes long time, longer, but will really nourish you. Sorry to interrupt you. Back to you. No, it's not. I, honestly, it's, I just find it so important to kind of highlight this thing back home because I think, especially for many single women, I'm saying women, I'm I don't mean to kind of cast men out because I think men could also maybe feel this way as well. I don't know if this happens in this, in, in same-sex relationships or if, it, if it's similar, but it's something where I think, you know, when you get to a certain stage, you think you have to deliver, is, you know, in quotation marks. And I think it can feel very pressurizing for the, if one or the other person isn't ready. And um, actually, they want to take more time there. So how do we kind of redesign that culture to actually see it that's just as important as the kind of the end result, really. Yeah. So for me, it all starts with an in- awareness and intention. So first of all, like we realize every area of your life, we sadly can we just rely that the best information will be given to us. We need to take responsibility for our own lives. We need to take full responsibility for our well-being. If we want to thrive, we need to put energy, time, resources into it. And we need to learn in order to evolve. So same with sexuality. We need to learn those things. Let's open to the idea that we need new education around sexuality. So it all starts with that, right? And when we do, then we can understand what are the different options? What are the different ways we can make love? What are different ways that our body can be aroused, that we can experience pleasure? So again, we can explore, but it's all about really unlearning some of those things that we learned and letting go of the idea that we just know it all and being open to learn and explore. Now, communication, I think often... In this, I see this happen so much in my courses, especially women at the beginning, you know, they come in, they start to really discover their body, they start to have all these types of orgasms and ride the waves of pleasure and have full body orgasms. And then it's like, oh my God, how am I going to communicate that? But when you actually start practicing it yourself, and that's what you will start to look for, you will start to attract different type of partners. Does that make sense? If you are not looking for a partner three o'clock in the morning being wasted in a club or, you know, in similar type of environments, but you are actually doing this in, let's say, a day conference around conscious lifestyle, I don't know, or a yoga class or some other environment, you are from the get-go going to attract different type of people with whom this type of conversation will be so much easier and then bring it and you will be surprised how people are open to that. It's the same as I am not being criticized. I'm not being judged. I'm not being, I don't even have trolls on my Instagram. I had maybe two or three for the last five years. So it's not true that people uh, will immediately judge you or will reject you because you want to have this type of a conversation. It's actually the opposite, but you need to try to experience it for yourself. So what would you say are the three top takeaways of how we can start exploring our sexuality more? I would say let go of an idea that orgasm has to happen 
and that orgasm is the only end goal of having sex? Is it with yourself or is it with your partner? Number one. Number two, self-pleasure is the key. Self-pleasure is your birthright. Self-pleasure is healing, nurturing, allows you to tap into your body, allows you to understand what you really like, uh, allows you to feel self-love. So many different things I can go on forever. So practicing high vibration masturbation, or if you want to call it conscious, intentional self-pleasure, self-love practice. So that's can I just two. step in on that one thing there? Yeah. For the top takeaways for the masturbation side of things, we spoke about that self-exploration earlier. You, mm-hmm. you say put one hour aside a week for that. Yeah. Do everything like you would do, like you would make love with your partner. So prepare your space, put a music on, light up some candles, some senses, start with a little bit of relaxation. Is it some kind of a breath work or guided meditation or a little bit of a dance or some shaking? Again, do a little bit of practices that you already know and enjoy that are going to allow you to slow down your mind and come closer to your body. And then don't go straight to the genitals. Explore all your body. Become aware what level of arousal are you at, low, medium, high, and then kind of going through the wave, not chasing the orgasm as fast as possible, but really enjoying the medium uh, state of arousal and then enjoying the high and then slowing down to a medium again and riding this wave using breath, using relaxation and sound. These are some of the things that we talked about and enjoying yourself without any particular goal in mind. And one time you might be crying and releasing, another time you might be experiencing full body orgasm. So just welcoming whatever is, allowing, relaxing into it. So that hopefully that helps for this self-love practice. So that was number two, right? And number three? And number three, adopt a mindset that there is so much to learn, that there is so much more to sex than what we know as a default, that there is such a huge opportunity into learning. And is it me as a teacher, is it this podcast, is it books, is it a retreat? There is so much available there. So again, taking your time, uh, taking a commitment to yourself, putting energy into it so you can grow, evolve as a person and experience the depth and beauty and the healing and the ecstasy and sexuality in all its aspects, in all its depth and glory, not just this one-sided point of view that we take away from pornography. So if you're actually listening to this podcast, realize, oh my God, I know nothing. There is so much I never even hear about that. Instead of judging yourself, I would say, hey, what an amazing opportunity. I am 40 and let's say, or 50, and there is so much more to explore. There's so much more to learn. How amazing, how exciting. And if you're with a partner for 10 years and thinking or 20 years that it's over and you're just doing the same thing and it's over, there is so much more to explore. I have clients who are 67 years old and come to my course and are having the best sex life of of their life. Some of them are couples, some of them are women by themselves. So again, something that I said at the beginning, it's never too late and see those things as a growth opportunity rather than judging or criticizing yourself. It's giving your space to to learn and grow, isn't it? I think that's such an important thing. And it's Mm -hmm. I think it's about giving yourself self-respect to actually Mm -hmm. allow you the opportunity to go into this. I think a lot of us can feel quite stigmatized in in not even just in this area, in so many areas where we maybe don't relate to instantly or we've had, you know, mixed messaging given to us. So I really hope this empowers so many. It's empowered me for sure in so many areas. And I think, you know, it's it's hopefully not just women that are going to listen to this. It's, it's hopefully men that are going to listen to this and feel that there's more of that connection energetically, which is huge on the intimacy level. And actually that it's not always leading to penetrative sex which is something which is always the end goal, but not the goal of this conversation that we're wanting to bring to everyone. Yes, absolutely. And yeah, and you know, this, this is also what I observe is there's a ripple effect. So whoever starts to practice that, 
you can actually see the difference, Sarah. Today, I even received a message from one of my clients. She's been a long time friend and she shared with me, you know what it looked from the outside. It looks like it's more about sex, but I actually see changes in every area of my life. I love myself more. I am not triggered about from things I used to be mad about. I am more calm. I am more creative. I see myself changing in so many other areas and I'm just blown away how this work influences me in every area of my life. And my husband notices that too. And now he wants to learn more too. So start with that's yourself. That's gold, isn't it? You inspire others. Goal. And I do think that's like with any health behavior. And I'm going to put this under a health behavior because it's one of the main ones. But I do think that as soon as you start changing a health behavior, you inspire others. And it's exactly what you've done by leaning into this work, sharing this work, exploring this work more for yourself and your journey. But also, you know, now you are inspiring so many. So thank you so much for coming on here and, and talking us through this journey. Even though I did spend a long time in orgasms, I do think it was important to start with. Absolutely. I'm so glad that we ended up going much more faster and broader. And, and, and hopefully many people are going to go and have an hour of sex sex exploration self exploration <laughs> so yeah solo sex or you know or partner sex both equally valid equally beautiful yeah. so bb before you go the last question i always leave with my guests on this podcast is what does live well be well mean to you live well be well to me being really being in tune with yourself being able to listen to your own inner knowing to be able to follow your passion, your truth, and feeling bold in it and feeling empowered by it. Feeling empowered by it. And to me then, that spills into other areas of your life. And when I started to listening to this voice, trusting this voice, speaking my truth, doing what I believe in, then everything else, really my, my well-being kind of, you know, explored uh, exponentially, uh, exploded exp exponentially. And I was able to follow my purpose, to be of service, to experience more joy in life. So yeah, that would be it. <laughs> I love that. I think honestly, it's just really inspiring. And I think the empowerment does really start with, with oneself. So it's been a really empowering episode and thank you so much for sharing it. For anyone who you've mentioned through this, you've got courses and, and resources and I'm sure that there's much more that people can explore deeper into this topic. Where would you advise them to go? So um, in terms of social media, my main channel is Instagram and because of my very complicated Polish name, I am called Planet BB, which is even from before I started all this journey, which is planet like planet Venus and then BIBI. -B -I. And then you can really in my link in my bio, you can find so many things. But if you are not on Instagram, you can type in energeticlovemaking.com and it will redirect you to, uh, to my main domain with my name. Uh, and I have also so many free practices for women only. There is erotic glow activation for couples. There is a soul connector. So just uh, download those and see how that feels. And if you then ready, if you're feeling into it, I have courses for women, uh, for couples, ladder to bliss, ecstatic lovers, orgasmic embrace online. You can do it from anywhere in the world. Uh, I have clients from all over the world calling in from the comfort of your own home. So it really, really allows people to feel safe uh, because they are in, again, the privacy of their own homes when we do those courses. So, 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 so much beauty with actually the online world that comes. I love this. I'm definitely going to go and explore this after this podcast. Um, Vivi, thank you so much for sharing such an insightful and important episode. I can't believe we've not done one on sex before. We're 100 episodes nearly down and this is the first one we've actually grasped the concept of sex. But it's so important and I'm so glad we did. So thank you so much for coming on this podcast and I'm sure we're definitely going to have to cross paths again and get you back yeah. on. Thank you so much. And again, better later than never. And I hope it paves, you know, the way for many more other teachers that are now coming in in this space. Beautiful, powerful. It's just amazing to be this part of that transformation. Some people even say that Tantra is the new yoga. 
And who would think 50 years ago that there will be a yoga studio around every corner, right? And, you know, hopefully it's going to be the same around conscious sexuality and people being able to have those conversations and understanding of that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Vivi. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Live Well, Be Well. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please can I ask one huge favor, if you could subscribe, share and rate this podcast, it would mean an immense amount to me and all the fantastic guests who come on to share their expertise and knowledge with us. It will keep this podcast growing and it will allow us to continue making episodes. Until next week, I hope you all live well and be well.